So I owe you an email. I know I'll send it tomorrow. Uh, I got jammed up this week. So. All right, let's get started. Um, hopefully, oh, sorry. Make sure I'm recording and all that jazz. All right, so what's going on? Um, lots of announcements. So first and most importantly, like so much, of the, so many of the projects are kind of slow to get off the ground. Then I'm going to move the midterm presentation until after spring break. So it's not whatever, it's supposed to be next Thursday. But we're going to talk about the midterm presentation today as we were already. Um, so start on it when you can, but we're not actually going to do it until uh, basically the, the week you're back. Um, so a couple of notes. So your presentation, like the file, is due the day before. Um, on the midnight on the 16th, and then you'll do the presentation in class on the 17th, okay? Um, and we'll talk about what's in it in a few minutes. Um, and then syllabus changes, I don't know, did you, were you able to make them or are they posted? Yeah, I uploaded, but... They um, did? Yeah. Okay, cool. So syllabus changes there. Um, it's a group project, so one submission with, you know, all the group members on the submission. Um, and... Related to that, what you're going to do is, um, oh, actually, could you make sure the sound's working? Oh, okay, sure. Um, uh, related to that is while the presentations are happening, you're going to fill out a form about everybody else's presentation. So basically, you fill out a Google form saying, you know, this is what I understood from this, you know, or, you know, is this a, is this a good solution to the problem, that kind of stuff. Um, so, but those will be due the following class, just in case you don't get all your notes in, in, in time. But my expectation is you're doing it real time. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, okay, so just in case, you know, you might be getting bored, uh, I wanted to make sure that, so we do have to do the team agreement. Oh, wait a minute, you guys did the team agreement. This is the, I cloned this slide from the other class and forgot to remove that. So you don't have that because you already did it. Um, you should be doing the, um, what should we call it though, the project assessment, um, but I think those are all in. I think I saw, did it? Yeah, we still don't know if you drew this. We didn't meet with the client yet. So okay, sure. okay, so if you haven't met with the client or don't feel like you're ready to submit the assessment, just write a private Piazza note, uh, list the other people in your team on the note, because you can't like multi, you can't send it from multiple people. Um, and just to ask for an extension, but what I want you to do is I want you to give me the deadline. So, you know, whenever you think you're going to meet with the client, you know, some period of time soon after that is when you'll, you'll do it by. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, and, you know, because, like you're not going to be negatively impacted because you're not able to schedule a meeting, but I do want to have like, you know, I want the forcing function of you all wanting to get those meetings done. Other questions? All right, uh, I think that's all that's in Gradescope right now. The midterm Gradescope thingy uh should be live like now. Like I think I set it up to open it too. Um, so, but it won't make a whole lot of sense until we get there. Okay, other thing I wanted to do was uh, prove to you that my thing the other day worked, uh, but I was doing something stupid. Uh, so I thought I'd show you my, uh, my little container. Um, so, uh, apparently I need to keep going. My goodness, a lot of real estate. Keep going. All right, finally. Okay, so um, just real quickly, because I strongly, strongly encourage you to start thinking about containers if you're not already. So this is analogous to Docker. Um, I just use another one that I told you it's called Podman, but the uh, the commands are synonymous. So it's it, the all the syntax 
It's exactly the same. But uh, so I just want to run the container. Like uh, I want to run, like take an instance of the image, run it as a container. I want it to destroy it when I shut it down, uh, so I don't collect junk. I want to run it in interactive mode, and I want to give it a TTY. Let me know what a TTY is. Uh, so this is uh, I can't remember what the acronym actually stands for, but it's a it's a terminal. So basically, most things won't run. They think they're running inside like a terminal or like in a computer. Uh, so you give it this to just tell it that that's where. The part I screwed up the last time is I forgot to give it the port assignment, and of course it's breaking badly here. But this minus p is assign the port on my machine 8088 to the port inside the container so that you can actually get to it. Uh, it will actually generate one, but you have to go and look, like look it up, uh, and that's what I was spacing on because I just wasn't seeing the fact that minus p wasn't there. Then I give it the directory I want. I uh, basically assign it to a place inside the container, and then this is the container I want to run. And I'm going to go this way so I don't trip too badly. And so now, wait for that to load, grab the URL, and if you notice it has a, a token there, so that's why I have to copy the URL, but it also means if you try to get to it from outside my computer, it won't work. Um, and there you go, and then all the uh, files that I have. This is actually from my other class. You know, I got a whole bunch of data sets. I got a whole bunch of notebooks, etc. Um, but they're all right here. And if I, you know, edit them, I can save them, and they'll still be on my local computer all that time. So uh, super handy. Um, and you know, if you've ever used Super Notebook before, you know how it works. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but then to get rid of it, I just Control C and kill it. And because of that minus RM, it just cleaned it out. So I don't I don't have the corrupt of it building up. I could keep it there and keep restarting it, um, but it's usually more hassle than it's worth for me. I usually just start it new. So makes sense. Okay. All right, I feel better now that I showed you a working demo because I was annoyed. Um, I can find my mouse and we'll go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, this lecture is kind of starts off with being about presentations, um, and then we'll talk about the midterm presentation in particular, uh, and then we'll hopefully, because I don't think it'll take me that long to get through this, hopefully you'll be able to team up and start working on a presentation, like try to get a little bit of it started uh, so that you can ask questions. Make sense? Okay, so first of all, when you're speaking, uh, you should focus on the speaker. Okay, um, and sorry, you should, <laughs> I should say focus on the audience. Sorry. Um, so this is that old trick, right? That you've probably heard in the past, right? You know, picture the audience in their underwear uh, if it makes you nervous. Um, one of the things that I do, I don't uh, like it, or it throws me off to kind of look you in the eye in an audience. So I actually tend to look at people's foreheads, um, which appears that I'm looking at your eyes, but I'm not actually. So it doesn't throw me off. Uh, so that's a trick I use. Um, it's usually like in this small room or even, even my bigger classes, it's like not enough people to really throw me. Um, you know, it's when it's like a thousand people that I get a little more nervous. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, next thing is, oh, sorry, I mentioned that already, eye contact. Um, another one is don't read. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's actually interesting because as a lecturer, you know, as a faculty member or whatever, uh, the way I get presentations is I, I write a lot of what I'm going to say as a reinforcement learning mechanism because a lot of people consume my reading or they're going to miss the class and so they need to be able to look at it later, etc. I would never have this much content on a slide if I was giving a, a like conference talk. Okay. Instead, I would have pictures of cats or something, something that kind of is reminiscent of whatever I'm talking about. Because the problem with stuff being up here is that you will read it and not listen to what I'm saying. So it's kind of a weird balance. This slide isn't actually that bad because it's got it's kind of it's just got keywords. Um, sorry. <coughs> um, so it just has keywords, so it, you can read it yourself fairly quickly. But it's something to really keep in mind is that. People lose focus if they're reading the slide. Okay, they won't hear what you're saying. 
Another one, uh, this comes from way back when I actually did some uh, like theater classes in college. They used to refer to it as happy feet. And this is the, you're talking like this and you're walking around a lot. There's a difference between that and directed walking. Okay, so when I walk over here and I point something out, okay, that's different, right? There's a purpose. And so you following me doing that is part of the lecture, right? Um, even pacing, it generally is okay. You'll see that a lot actually in TED Talks. A lot of TED Talkers tend to do a lot of pacing. I don't know if it's like guidance or something, but um, but happy feet is when you just kind of move around a lot. I mean, it, it's hard to like think, but you'll catch yourself doing it. And the last thing is worry about volume, okay? If you are not a loud speaker, or in my case, I was a camp counselor for a number of years, uh, basically you can hear me down the street if I want you to. Um, but a lot of people don't aren't that loud or they don't project that much. Uh, so it's worth checking the back of the room if they can't hear you. Um, so many locations now actually have microphones available with speakers. So often consider that as an option, uh, especially if it's gonna be recorded because the microphone will pick up the sound uh, directly on your body much better than it will me like projecting to it. So if I was gonna do better quality recordings, I actually wouldn't project so much. I would wear a mic and kind of speak normally. All right, so but the biggest solution to these bottom three, okay, is rehearsal, okay? One thing that people do not realize is that giving a talk, giving a lecture, whatever, requires rehearsal. So every time I give a presentation, my presentations get better. Um, they get tighter. I tend to, you know, wander off a lot less often. I'm more aware of where the slides are, etc. So for these presentations, you will be graded on them. You better rehearse. It will be obvious if you do not, especially when we get to one of the requirements that's later, which is um, a terrible way to give talks, but we'll talk about that in a bit. We're talking saying this looks familiar. Uh, all right, so this is one of the, oh, did I do it again? Agenda? No, yeah, well, no. All right, so for example, these issues have way too much content. Okay, there's just way too much here. Or if you feel like you need to do this, literally pause when you when you get to that slide and say, I'll give you a minute to read that. Okay, and just wait for people to read it, then start talking. Okay, it can be a little hard to tell or guess how long it'll take them to read it. Some a lot of the time you can go by eye focus. So if they're if everyone in the crowd is staring at the screen, some portion of them will kind of come back to looking at you. When, when most people are done reading. So that's a good time to continue. All right, uh, this is another one. Remember the size of whatever you're putting up on the screen. Um, I actually use a terrible template for accessibility and I want to go through, basically if I hadn't gotten COVID over Christmas, I would have gone through all of my lecture decks and reversed them. Light colors on dark are much harder to read and are even worse for somebody who has any sort of visual impairment. Um, and so one of the things to know, and this you know, is kind of backed up by a lot of science, is like, if you are doing light on dark, you actually have to make the font bigger than you would if it was dark on light. Make sense? So just keep that in mind. Color blindness is another big one. You know, so if you're gonna put a graph or something, I think for all of you, this is gonna be relevant. You're gonna put a graph up. Careful of your colors. Either get like you can have colors, but then have other mechanisms that indicate whatever it is. So, like I used to play a phone game, for example, that had a colorblind mode that I used to turn on because sometimes I couldn't tell if it was like an orange or a yellow, um, just because I'm not very good with colors. Um, and it would actually basically it made all the oranges also have a little plus sign in the dot, and all the yellows also had a you know a star in the dot or whatever. So add in some extra information so that people who can't see your colors for whatever reason, sometimes they just the get washed out because of the lighting. Uh, and so if you have something else there, it'll, it'll often save your butt. Uh, grammar, spelling, and accuracy uh, is also very important. I will be grading for this, okay? And the reason is, is because when you work in tech, a lot of what you do is written communication. Okay? It is very important 
that you be good at it, okay? And by good at it, I mean be able to do a credible first draft, find other people to help you fix it, okay? Either with things like Grammarly or friends or going down to the writing center or whatever it takes. I rarely, if ever, send an important email without getting someone else to read it first, okay? So just keep that in mind. I'll grade for it because I'm a jerk about it. Uh, also, it's pet peeve, but um, it's also, it's primarily actually because it's important that you get good at it. Okay, so this is a, a size, you know, problem here. Um, I assume none of you can read basically anything in any of these, right? That means they are too small, okay? We're gonna show these again in a minute uh, and, they'll, and they're a bit, a bit better, but uh, just kind of keep that in mind um, that if you can't see it, two things happen. One, you're not gonna communicate as well uh, unless whatever it says is unimportant. But there's another problem, going back to that reading problem. If people have a hard time reading it, they're and even more of their focus on trying to read it, even if the thing you're trying to read is irrelevant. So you, if you do want to show something like this and the words don't really matter, I would actually fuzz them out so they are unreadable. Because then the temptation to read it is removed. Make sense? All right. Another one is use color to indicate information. Okay. Again, I go back to that color blindness problem and accessibility problem. But uh, make sure the color actually tells you something. So can anybody tell me what's wrong with the blue in this column? Like, why, why is this blue worthless? Or a bad use of color? Yeah. Okay. Why not? Because it's calling, it's just coloring one column. Right. We already know that this column is components. It has a column for crying out loud. Why is it blue too? Okay. So a much better use of the blue would be to maybe call out a feature, like something going across, right? Because then it would show more information than just the columns. Okay. So it is very tempting, I think, to color things like these columns. Okay. But just kind of ask yourself when you're looking at the picture that you just made, right? Am I actually conveying new information with color? Um, a or B, could I add color to convey, to make it clearer what I'm trying to you know, point out? Um, it's especially bad because that blue thing over there, like how is that related to these blue things? Right? I don't, I don't think that they are. Right? So, you know, it's got to be consistent as well. Um, and hopefully uh, Rafat does not remember who these people were or anything. Um, but this one I found particularly funny and even though I'm throwing a, a team a little bit under the bus, it still me up and so I still had to do it. Um, this is what I mean by making sure that your spelling and accuracy and all that stuff is, is correct, okay? That is not the name of their project that they put in a big huge title slide. Okay, the name of their project was the Mindful Applicant. Those are two different words, okay? So the trick here, this is, this is the kind of thing that you as the author do not catch. Like, it's very hard to catch this kind of error. Much, much better if you can just give it to somebody else and be like, yo, can you look at my Mindful Applicant uh, slide deck? And the first thing you're gonna say, wait, what'd you say that project was? Right, so keep that in mind. All right, so um, this is kind of just another example of like trying to minimize the information that is written on the slide by dumping some of the repeated information, okay? So by putting this up here and that over there, this gets more consumable. It's still, right? I probably would have limited this maybe to four and blew up the font, but the idea is if you can extract repeated data or whatever, that's a good way uh, to pass you know, pass more information uh, without destroying the slide. Another related one is you get really, this is a really good use of color and arrow here, right? Because that arrow, the arrow on the end implies the so that, right? So this is a really, I really like this slide. Like I said, I would cut it off at full. Other than that, it's pretty good. Oops. 
Um, this is another treatment, same idea, right? Like, is like they they decided instead of trying to cram it all into one slide, they said we're going to make four slides, okay, and treat them each individually. But if you notice, um, the layout of the slide stays the same, okay. So it's going between these four is also easier to consume because you don't have to process what the slide looks like because they're all the same. Right? And then only the details of each component change. So you can kind of, you can kind of throw out the what's the structure part of your brain and instead just focus on the actual changes. Make sense? Um, you know, there, there are, uh, there's actually a number of very good books on writing presentations. Um, and if you want recommendations, I can't think of one, of what I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Um, but Tufty actually, who, uh, used to be at Tufts, I think, uh, one of the schools nearby is kind of like the, uh, one of the leaders in this area. Um, and he has a book, but then there's been a few others that are really good too. Let me know if you want to read any of those and I can, I can definitely tell you some more names. Um, but yeah, so I'm just kind of glossing over it. Uh, to give you an idea. Um, so this is a concept uh, that uh, is increasingly common, I would say, in industry, is this idea of what, what is jokingly and seriously referred to as a market. Okay, so everybody here knows what an architecture is, right? What do you think a market texture would be? Any ideas? What? Market? Uh, what does that mean, though? So not exactly. So that's why I was clarifying because uh, the word market is correct, but you have to add an end ending on it to get to the right meaning. Marketing architecture. Yeah, marketing architecture. Okay, so what what would that mean? It's like a simplified version of the architecture. Exactly. So it's a simplified version of the architecture. Like I said, semi jokingly, semi seriously referred to as a architecture um, because what it does is kind of gives relative layman um, an idea of how the application uh, fits together. Um, this is not a requirement for your presentation, but I wanted to show you it uh, just because they come up a lot. Um, and it's also a good example of a slide, right? Like I said, it conveys a lot of information without being overly busy with writing, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. All right, so now for the midterm. So basically the column on the left, these are all the pieces of information that you have to have in, the, in your presentation, okay? Now, keep in mind, I'm expecting that these presentations are like five to seven slides at the outside. Okay, that one I showed you back there with the user stories across four in, in my head, right? That's still like one slot, right? Um, but five to seven. So even though there's a long list here, it shouldn't be 20 slides, 30 slides long. Um, so name of the project of the client, whatever is appropriate. Uh, I prefer project, um, including both. Um, but you know, your mileage may vary. All right, names of the team members. Uh, I've seen various treatments of that were, were pretty interesting. Um, problem statement. So whatever, you know, what are you trying to actually resolve? We've talked about this a few times. Um, however, your team has decided to do requirements, okay? I prefer user stories and a lot of machine learning projects, I find they're not as easy to develop um, because the outcomes are, are kind of too broad. Uh, so do, do what's appropriate, but what I want to know is, okay, you told me what the problem was, tell me that problem broken down into some pieces is kind of what I'm getting at in this, okay? Then basically the next one is like, okay, this is almost like your architecture slide in the sense of show me what you're going to do, right? Um, so I'm broadly calling that, you know, showing me the models you're going to use, but it could be like the approach or it could be, you know, but basically let's see a technical probably drawing with some decoration, some text on it um, that tells me how your, how your system is going to accomplish these. 
that make sense? Okay. Deployment plan. So this is, um, I should have used different words than plan, but uh, this is, I, I imagine like a picture again of like when we were talking about pipelines the other day. Um, so what kind of pipeline do you think you want to do? So this is going to require some research on your part, maybe talking to me um, to figure out if you want to use like a GitHub action, you want to go play around with that Azure thing, you want to do something else. But I want to know what kind of pipeline you're going to use. Um, and, you know, I'll be even more excited if you've actually built it. Um, because I will tell you the project or the, the assignment that's immediately after this is to build the pipeline. So, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt you to build it and then draw a picture of it. Um, so, and then milestones and timeline. Um, and because wherever you are, you might have completed some stuff by then. Otherwise, it's future. You know what I mean? Um, but there's, sorry, I should have done this slightly differently too. There's like two kinds of future. There's future as in stuff we're going to do this semester, and then there's stuff that you think could be done someday in the future. Okay, so try to have that distinction. If you don't have any of the latter, that's okay. Um, but you know, if, if you have things that you know are out there, but you're not planning on addressing them this semester, that's where that goes. Okay. And then basically anything else that you think seems relevant, okay? Um, and that will vary quite a bit by project. Sorry, notifications that I'm putting do not serve on. Um, that'll vary by project, uh, you know, and may or may not include any of that. All right, so then in order to uh, kind of submit it, you take whatever technique that you use to create the slides um, convert that to a PDF, okay, and then upload that PDF to uh, Gradescope. Um, there's a reminder in the Gradescope assignment of these, okay, um, in case you need it. These slides will also get posted, so you can look at these two, whatever you like. Um, just one uh, nicety for us is if when you upload the PDF, if you can try to make sure the file name includes your project name or at least the client name. Because what I do is I download them all at once and then look at them. So uh, it's easier on my file system. It's easier on my brain. Um, so they're due on the 16th at midnight. Okay. Then you're going to present them on the 17th. Okay. You have approximately 10 minutes. You know, see how it goes. Um, you know, if you're, you know, if you're at nine or if you're at 11, you're not going to be really penalized. This is just my kind of expectation of what the length I'm expecting. Okay. Now this is a hard. This is what I was saying about the rehearsal before. This is very hard. Co-presenting is significantly more difficult than presenting on your own, um, because doing transitions to somebody else is very hard. In this class, I expect that you'll both do about half. Okay, but it doesn't have to be half, right? It's kind of like figure out what you want to do, but practice that transition. So rehearse it on your own. Like you can just do your part, you know, try to get that better. Do it in front of a mirror. That's a classic um, so that you can see how you're uh, interacting with your audience, basically. Um, but at some point, I strongly recommend that you rehearse it at least a few times with your partner. Okay. So you get that transition uh, because those transitions tend to like bump badly. Um, and yeah, and rehearse, 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 rehearse. You'll hear me say that a lot. Um, oh, sorry, before I move on, any questions so far? Does this make sense? Um, as much of this information as possible, I put in the grade scope assignment, but the last time I gave out this assignment, I actually had it as a separate doc. Uh, so if you feel like there's not enough information there or something, just let me know because I didn't think to put it in or something. All right. All right, so this is the inter-team evaluations. Um, the, the text of the evaluation, like the, the questions, are quite long. So I would strongly recommend giving, getting a chance to read it. Just go read the form before the class. Okay? And like, because they're, they're very descriptive. Um, it'll probably take you, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, not a whole lot of effort, but it'll make it a lot easier if you read it once when you go and try to like review them while they're presenting live, if you know what I mean. Um, so I, I strongly recommend that. 
Um, and so, yeah, you have to do one per team. This is not a group project. Okay. So, as a human individual, for all the teams that are not yours, I want one review. Okay. Um, and those are due on the 24th, uh, which is basically because the presentations are on the Thursday lecture that we come back. Uh, and then this is basically the following Tuesday. All right. Questions? All right. Uh, so I wanted to go through a few more samples. This is just an example of a timeline that I liked from last semester. Um, you know, and uh, you know, you can get fancy like this, but you don't really have to. It's just that when you do nice graphics like this, uh, it does convey the information better. And I strongly recommend hacking up pieces that you find, you know, kind of on the internet. Now, you got to be a little bit careful in that you have to attribute stuff that you use of others, okay? So, or find things that are don't require attribution. So, if you want, um, I should probably put these in the slide somewhere, but um, actually, if Fedora comes with a uh, built into the browser, when you get it, it actually comes with a free content like set of uh, sites. Um, so Creative Commons is a good source. Um, there's a new one though that hasn't made it into this list called um, uh, shoot, uh, what is it called? Um, let me just Google it real quick. There's a uh, you, you're gonna love this. There's a DNS server that has a very similar name, and I mix up the two all the time. Um, Oh, uh, sorry. One thing to keep in mind too is um, uh, Google's image search. If you dig around in the tools, you can actually set the licensing that uh, it's going to return on. So sometimes you get very good results from that as well. Um, Unsplash. Is that what it's called? Yeah. So uh, there's another new one, like I said, Unsplash, Creative Commons. Google image search, those are all quite good. Um, Creative Commons, what it does is actually turns around and searches a bunch of other sites. Uh, so it's kind of like an aggregator. Uh, that's why it's super useful. Um, whatever tool you're using to make your slides probably comes with a ton of free to use content that is already licensed for you to use that you bought in the purchase price of whatever software you bought. Um, Okay, any questions about that? All right, I'll try to remember if, or if anybody needs it, I'll try to remember to post like a Piazza post with a list of these. Um, I just didn't think of it beforehand. So this is that truck, the technical architecture site. This is still quite small. I would actually blur those over there because they're so hard to read. Um, but you can imagine it's pretty close if you imagine this being the size of the slide. Like, you know what I mean? Instead of an image in the middle. Um, so then this might be okay. Uh, and then here is just one I wanted to show you one. This is more of a deployment uh, architecture or a deployment plan, or you know, it's kind of about 60,000 different names. Um, but so this is more about taking an application rather than the architecture. So this might be something similar to what you might want to make for your pipeline. Okay. And I think that's it. Um, so this is just a rehash of the announcements. Um, but like I said, I wanted to give you all some time to 